can now move to member statement. I, I recognize the member for Simcoe Brook. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to use my time this morning to pay tribute to the people in my riding of Simcoe Gray and across this great province who enrich our communities through their dedication, commitment, and generosity. They are our volunteer speaker, and the work they do every day in our communities to improve and enrich the lives of so many residents, young and old, goes beyond words. Next month, the Ontario Volunteer Service Awards will be handed out. Started in 1986, this great program is an opportunity for us to thank and recognize the many, many volunteers who give their time and expertise selflessly. Groups such as the Tech We Will Women's Institute, founded in 1947, the Beaver Valley Community Outreach, founded in 1982, the Lions Club of Wasega Beach that recently celebrated 60 years, the Collingwood Salvation Army that recently celebrated 140 years, the Wasega Beach Royal Canadian Legion Branch 465 that was just constituted last month, the South Georgian Bay Community Health Care Centre, the Clearview Public Library Board and the Stevenson Memorial Auxiliary. To all those who will receive an Ontario Volunteer Service Award next month, I want to congratulate you on behalf of the residents of Simcoe Gray. And to all the many organizations in Simcoe Gray and the incredibly dedicated volunteers that serve, I want to thank you for your service and for your willingness to help your neighbours and make our communities so much stronger, resilient and compassionate. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you. Next member, Stanley, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. Six years after the Conservatives formed government, Ontario still doesn't have a strategy to address hate and racism. This is an embarrassment and another failure in this government's tarnished record. Not only does Ontario lack a comprehensive anti-hate strategy, but we also have a premier who evokes a racist trope from behind a government podium. Just last week, without any evidence, the premier speculated that immigrants are behind the shooting at a girls' Jewish school. It is a shockingly racist comment to scapegoat immigrants for this senseless act. The police who are actually investigating the crime had to distance themselves from the premier's comments. This is the same premier who blamed COVID-19 on immigrants. He blames Ontario's housing crisis on international students. The same premier who vilified Umar Zamir and called for the jailing of this brown Muslim man who is now found innocent by the courts. The premier has denied the existence of systemic racism and cancelled Ontario's anti-racism director de directorate, including its committees on anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-black racism and anti-indigenous racism. It seems like the Premier could use the Directorate's advice now more than ever before. Ontario cannot combat racism if this Premier does not recognize that it exists. Naming it is the first step to dismantling this hateful power. I feel like I have to say this every day in this House. All forms of hate are interconnected and have the same goal, to divide us people, to make us afraid, to have us untrust each other, and to de distract us from building stronger communities that actually care for each other. Ontario needs a comprehensive Thank you. Next member statement. Next member statement. The member for Orleans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, residents in Orleans and across Ontario are asking if the convenience of buying a beer at the corner store is really worth a billion dollars. The answer, of course, is no. And so, why the rush? We have a teacher shortage. Ontario schools need billions in repair. And this government has cut nearly $1,500 in per-student funding since they were elected in 2018. But there's a billion dollars to accelerate corner store beer sales by a year. Two million Ontarians don't have a family doctor. Imagine not a single person in the combined cities of Ottawa, Windsor, London, Kingston and Guelph have a family doctor. But there's a billion dollars to accelerate corner store beer sales by a year. Instead of cutting education and health care further, Madam Speaker, perhaps this government will do what they always do which is just to take on more and more debt. Madam Speaker, it's not what we need. If this government were to auction off the new liquor licenses, it could net, it could net nearly $300 million in additional value to taxpayers. This is what the Conservative governments in Alberta and Saskatchewan did, netting a small fortune to fund education and health care. And since this government's refusing to follow the lead of these fiscally conservative governments, I, has to, I have to ask, which friend, supporter, or crony is going to benefit at the expense of students, teachers, nurses, doctors, at the expense of all of us, Madam Speaker? In the end, this government cares little about fiscal responsibility, having increased the debt by over $100 billion under their watch, the largest debt of any subnational jurisdiction in the world. This
Thank you. Next member statement. Member for Halliburton, Walter Lakes Block. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's my pleasure today to rise to highlight the incredible inductees into the Halliburton Highlands Sports Hall of Fame for 2024. Created five years ago, the Hall of Fame has been a source of local pride and honour. At the induction ceremony, we celebrated the incredible achievements and dedication of our local athletes, coaches and builders who have made significant contributions to the community. A total of 10 individuals and two teams received awards across multiple sports, including the Halliburton County Red Wolves, becoming the first recipients of the Outstanding Achievement Award. Part of the Special Olympics Ontario, the Red Wolves helped athletes and supporters connect through sports like bowling, curling and golf. The Red Wolves bowling team has competed locally, provincially and nationally since it was founded in 1997. I'd like to recognize one of the Red Wolves and a hometown hero of mine, the late Kerry Crago, who was selected to compete in the 2006 National Games in Brandon, Manitoba and brought home a bronze medal in bowling. Thank you, Kerry, for your passion and dedication to our community and for making your hometown of Kinmount proud. I encourage all of you to stop by the Halliburton Highlands Sports Hall of Fame, visit their website, tributes for each inductee. You can see firsthand how Halliburton County works hard and plays harder. Yay. Member statements. The member from Mishkegawak, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. President. The Maison Verte is a producer. Maison Verte is a main producer to plant trees in the north. Seeds are being given to our forests, but it is threatened by the increase of other production. Maison Verte Greenhouse faces issues with revenue to some increase during the pandemic and also the increase of some other costs. they face issues with suppliers like PRT in BC. It is impossible for small supplier to be in competition with the large corporations. Small companies like Maison Verte are being invaded by other corporations from other provinces without any protection from our government. They cannot survive. Since Maison Verte was open, Small producers, same as La Maison Verte, went from 39 to 4 in the province. There's an importance to protect small suppliers. M Maison Verte supplies 5 to 7 million of seedlings to the forest when the large one just supply with 800,000 at concurrential prices. We need to have some elements to make sure that the market is more equitable. It is important that producers like Maison Vert may keep working and participating to the health of our forests. I ask all the MPPs to support us and support the local suppliers, and this would be an emergency measure. Thank you very much, Mr. Pete, Speaker. Landbrook. Thank you, and good morning, Mr. Speaker. I am so very proud to rise this morning to recognize our government's recent investment in Hamilton. The Ontario government is investing up to $2.5 million to support the construction of Kemp Care Network's new 10-bed children's hospice, which will help families connect to comfortable and dignified end-of-life care close to home in my city of Hamilton. Keaton's House, Paul Paletta Children's Hospice, will offer families comprehensive palliative care for children and youth living with progressive life-limiting illnesses. Mr. Speaker, the hospice is expected to open in 2026 and will include a number of features and services, including 10 bedrooms for children where family members can stay with their child and space for day wellness programs and therapies such as massage, movement, recreation and music. Through the 2024 budget, our government is adding up to 84 new adult beds and 12 pediatric beds bringing the total to over 740 planned beds. 
Once these beds open, the Ontario government will invest up to $2 million $268,000 in annual operational funding for Keaton's House, Paul Paletta Children's Hospice to support the delivery of nursing, personal support and other end-of-life care services. I am so proud of our government for taking action to connect Ontario families with the care they need close to home. I am also proud of organizations in my community, such as Camp Care Network and McMaster Children's Hospital, for making this expansion of Keaton's House Paul Paletta Children's Hospice possible. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Uh, thank you, Speaker. You will know that the 80th anniversary of the D-Day invasion will be marked on June 6. All Canadians should remember that 14,000 Canadian soldiers landed at Juneau Beach in France on June 6, 1944, as part of a massive Allied invasion. The invasion led to the liberation of German-occupied France and was pivotal in ending the Second World War. Victory in the Normandy campaign, however, came at a terrible cost. Canadians suffered the most casualties of any division, more than 5,000 Canadian troops dying in the invasion and the Battle of Normandy that followed. We all owe these brave men and women an immeasurable debt of gratitude. And as the years passed, sadly, the number of veterans who fought in the campaign uh, declined. They are from a resilient generation who endured many hardships and experienced the unimaginable horrors of war. Uh, we recently were able to celebrate Hamiltonian Jack Frederick Finnan, a 104-year-old Canadian veteran who served with the Canadian Rural Air Force. Many dignitaries were on hand, including the Governor General, when uh, the French ambassador awarded Jack France's highest military honour, the, the French Legion of Honour. I'd like to remark that hundreds of Canadian aircraft were in the air on D-Day, including the legendary Lancaster bomber, which is what, uh, uh, and, and that Mr. Finnan is Canada's oldest living uh, pilot of the Lancaster bomber. There are many uh, celebrations across Canada to help commemorate the 80th anniversary of the pivotal D-Day in invasion. In Hamilton, we, you can visit the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum that has one of the last flying Lancaster bombers. And so I encourage all of us Let's take a moment to pause and pay tribute. We will remember them. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Brantford Brant. Good morning, Speaker. I am pleased to rise this morning to speak about the wave of excitement that washed over Brantford Brant last Saturday. The Woodman Pool opened for the first time this past weekend and welcomed a capacity crowd of swimmers of all ages. The new pool's opening was eagerly awaited by Brant the Brantford Brant community ever since the old pool closed in 2020. While the pool's official opening is still slated for June 29th, these summer weekends have been too beautiful to waste and Mayor Kevin Davis has called for the pool to be opened every weekend in June while the finishing touches are being completed. The pool is part of the newly revamped Woodman Park Community Centre, which keeps Brantford entertained year-round. Once the Woodman project is completed, it will include a community garden, accessible playground equipment, games tables, walking paths, and shade structures. This project represents the great things that we can achieve together when all three levels of government work together as the pool was funded by both the provincial and federal government alongside the city of Brantford. I am proud to represent the government that places a high importance on community recreation projects such as this one. By ensuring the people of Ontario have state-of-the-art facilities to enjoy, our government continues to make Ontario the best place to live, work, play and raise a family. Here, Thank here. you, Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Whitby. Well, thank you, Speaker. Two new schools are going to be built in West Whitby, thanks to our Minister of Education, the Honourable Stephen Lecce. Thirteen, a uh, thirty point five million dollars for an elementary school at Maskell Crescent and Coronation Road, creating six hundred thirty-four student spaces and forty-nine childcare spaces, and twenty-three point four million dollars for a new elementary school at. Skisco Drive and Lamont Street, creating 634 student spaces. 
Speaker, on May 17th, the Minister of Education also announced funding for new schools and one school expansion across Oshawa and Clarington, which will result in the creation of 3,155 new student spaces and 98 childcare spaces. Speaker, this was an historic day as the overall investment was $139.5 million and is the single largest in Durham history. We are working to encourage Whippy children have access to state-of-the-art schools close to home that gives them real-life job skills to succeed in the future. Speaker, our government is getting it done once again for hard-working families in the region of Durham. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Kitchener, South Hess, please. Thank you, Speaker. Um, on, uh, on Saturday morning, I went to the Weston Harbour Castle Hotel in Toronto and uh, signed in, uh, went up the elevator, up some stairs to the very top of the building and uh, uh, about 400 feet up and, and stepped off the edge. Um, I was luckily attached to some fairly uh, strong harnesses at the time, but that doesn't really make it any less unnerving because uh, the one thing your body doesn't want you to do when you're on the edge of a building is jump off of it, which I did. Um, I did this to uh, raise awareness to a, uh, a fundraising campaign for ProAction Cops and Kids, which is an uh, incredible charity that I became aware of in my work as an MPP. ProAction Cops and Kids has uh, five chapters, Toronto, Durham Region, Hamilton, Halton, and Peel. And essentially what it does is it allows kids who are under-resourced uh, to connect with police officers who donate their time to run sports programs, baking programs, sailing, et cetera. Um, and ProAction covers all the costs of equipment and facilities. I became involved because I am so incredibly passionate about the idea of uh, community policing and prevention-based policing which is about building strong relationships between the community and police, particularly children. A uh, huge thank you to um, ProAction team members, Jean Milligan, Michelle Marchetti, and Nicole Benoit. I know you all worked incredibly hard. And to all of the officers and kids that participated uh, in going over the edge with me on Saturday morning. Thank you so much, Speaker. Member statements? Still one more? We're done? We're done. That concludes our member's statements for this morning.